Hello and welcome at the GCP Mindset channel. I hope you're doing well. We thought it might be a good idea to speak a little bit about different jobs in clinical research. And the start will be clinical monitoring. And I have with me here Bianca Seifert, very experienced CIA, currently head of clinical monitoring um, in a clinical monitoring department. And she will tell us a little bit about the daily life of a CIA. So thank you Andreas for inviting me and I'm happy to be here to tell you a little bit about how clinical research and especially CRA work is in real life. Yeah, great. Thank you. Bianca, thank you very much for being here to tell us a little bit about the daily work of a CIA. Normally nobody speaks about drug development. Currently everybody speaks and uh, People are very impatient. Yeah, they want that uh, we develop very soon a um, uh, vaccine or a drug against COVID. Um, but actually, most of the people don't know how to develop drugs and, and other products in, healthcare, in the healthcare system. Um, let's start uh, to speak about a very important position in clinical research, about clinical monitoring or the CIA position. And um, what makes you an expert in clinical monitoring? So um, I think what makes me an expert is basically my experience I gained over the last years. So I'm working in the field of clinical monitoring for about a little bit more than six years now. And I started first in, uh, in Austria, um, where I was just um, responsible for sites in, in Austria. And then I moved back to Germany to be able to um, work with sites in Germany, um, Switzerland and Austria. So I was able to expand a little bit. And I did that for several years in different um, trials and different indications. And now, um, I think about like half a year ago, I decided to go one step further and I want to share um, my knowledge about what I learned basically. So um, I um, ended up here at GCP Service now as head of clinical monitoring to support uh, younger CRAs, especially with my knowledge that I was able to gain. Great. Yeah, but please keep in mind that uh, some of our followers don't have so much uh, experience with clinical research. What is a site? Yeah, what does it mean? What kind of sites did you visit? So when CRAs talk about sites, they usually mean um, like a private practice or also a big clinic where um, the clinical um, study is basically performed. So there's, um, it's actually the center where the practical part is happening. And um, we just um, simply shorten it by calling it sites <laughs> or clinical trial sites. Great, thanks. Very impressive that you also monitored in several countries in Europe. Um, but let's talk now about the real topic, about the daily life of a CIA and what can our followers expect. So let's imagine a CIA gets up in the morning and leaves the home. Yeah? What, what then? So um, I think you're mostly interested in the practical part of CRA works and this means traveling. So you basically get up in the morning, get prepared, pack your stuff or already take your stuff that you have packed and leave the house to go to the um, sites I mentioned before. So you go to the clinic or the private practice to work there and um, this basically means also a lot of traveling for sure. So depending on where the sites are, it's um, about like maybe a two hour ride or you have like half a day of traveling with train, car, plane, whatever suits you most and what's the most effective way to get there. So personally, I prefer to take the train because it's for me the smoothest way to get somewhere. I can use the time in the train to prepare a little bit um, when I go on site. And um, also after the visit, it makes sense to have some time and think about uh, what you have done and maybe document what you have done. So traveling the train is my preferred way um, of going to the sites. And um, yeah, basically you travel quite a lot as a CRA. Yeah. Um, you, you said uh, just train is your most preferred way of traveling. I, I can imagine that's also because the German situation is quite nice. So even everybody is complaining about Deutsche Bahn, but actually the, it's quite comfortable to travel um, by train in Germany. I think in some other countries it might be a bigger problem, like in Scandinavian countries. 
the CIs are going back high, imagine, can you imagine? Yeah, for yeah. sure. So yeah. it um, really depends how the connection is. So I also have my four hours rule, for example, which means everything where I can go by train in four hours, um, I don't take the plane, for example, because yeah. it makes no sense for me to have these one hour steps waiting one hour and then you go into the plane and stuff like this but with the train you just go there for four hours and you can use the time effectively yeah very good point um what do you mean with uh, a lot of traveling what uh, how often do they need to travel this year as normally so uh, based on the most um, studies i was working on and what i also know from colleagues it's that you travel about two to three days per week which is if you take an average for the month about like 60 percent traveling so um, it's a lot i would say for compared to regular jobs yeah okay that's understandable um but actually traveling is not the goal of clinical monitoring um, it's the goal is to be at the study site and what's the job of a CIA at the site then? So for me, basically, CRA is like the key position for clinical trials in a certain way. Because when you ask me what you do on site, it, it's basically everything you just can't do on site. So there's stuff you can check um, from the office for sure. But as a CRA, you're the on, one of the only persons who can see how stuff is really performed at a clinic or at a private practice. And if the stuff that's performed is also according to the study protocol, which is like kind of like the guideline for the clinical trial, how you should do it. And on the other hand, also according to, um, to um, local laws. So there's like a restriction what you can do. And as a CRA, you check for that. So first of all, the most important part, especially for people who have no idea about clinical trial, is to check for informed consent. Was the patient really... Um, um, or did the patient really want to participate in the trial on his free will? Did he in receive all information? And this is stuff that you only can check when you are on site. Um, but for other things, for example, you can also just check for um, the medication. What has been delivered is the stuff that is there really used only for patients or did somebody take something at home, which should not happen because it's actually stealing medication. Um, and this is something you just can do by counting what's there, what has been delivered, what has been used, what was maybe returned. Or a classic example is also, especially regarding documentation on site, that the amount of documentation the site has to do for a clinical trial is a lot higher than they would do during their usual practice. So did they document everything what they did? And uh, based on that, did they do everything correctly? Have they also checked all um, events that occurred with a patient? So especially according to patient safety. So the goal is to keep the patient safe during the trial. And on the other hand, for sure, assure that the data are correct, that we can use it for later analysis. And um, these two points basically make the um, basic of what you check on site. And there are a lot of other things for sure, yeah. if you would go more detail. Okay. Clinical monitoring means then actually controlling. Yes. Okay. Basically. That's uh, the main job of a CAA. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what kind of educations do they need then? I mean, they need to understand somehow what they should control. Exactly. So there's, as a clinic monitoring is not like a classic education job that you can have. There are professional trainings that you can do before you become a CRA, but a lot of stuff is learning by doing. So basically you um, have a slight advantage when you're coming from a background of biology or medicine, but it's not like um, the basic you need to do it. Everybody can become a CRA as soon or as, uh, in case he's able to learn the stuff he needs to use for the trial. Yeah, when you say everybody, I think ICH says uh, they need to have a clinical and or scientific background. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you worked in a kindergarten, for example, uh, that would not be the right job according to the regulation. So there's like... Um, I would say it's ICH uh, GCP for sure who prefers this kind of position, but on the other hand, you need to be properly trained and this training can be offered to you also by okay. sponsor or by the CRO. So you can educate yourself to become a CRA. Okay. So that means really everybody can become a CRA? Yes. Okay. Um, when you say everybody 
can become a CIA. What's your preference based on your experience? Um, who should become a CIA? Uh, who is the most successful and the best trained and best performing CIA based on the education? So based on my experience, I would always um, recommend or prefer that you have a background in um, scientific or medical um, um, yeah, studies or work field as well. So it's not like you need to have a PhD, for example. But if you come from a from a medical background, or for example, you worked as a as a nurse at a clinic or um, or a biologist in a laboratory, you have some basic basics you bring into the job. You know how maybe a protocol is look like because you know about scientific writing or as a study nurse, um, as a nurse from the clinic basically, you know how the practical life is there and you may be even coming from a specific indication and you bring background information for that indication according to medications and medical history or typical um, events that occur. So all of this is in the end something that can help you to do the job a lot faster and a lot more um, professional than somebody that's coming from a completely different background. So this is something you really also have to take into acknowledge and thinking about uh, becoming a CRA. Okay, yeah. And I think when you um, evaluate the educations worldwide um, in, in the US, you have more nurses who are doing the CRA job. In Western Europe, you have more uh, scientists. And in Eastern Europe, you have also a lot of medical doctors who are doing the job. So there's no real black and white and who's better because I think the CIAs are doing all over the world uh, a great job. Exactly. So it does not based on the, the title you have in front of yeah. the name. It's more about like how well you fit because it does not, not, not the medical background makes you a good CRA. There are a lot of different components that are important as well. And just because you maybe have a PhD, it does not make you the best CRA, just because you maybe can read a protocol twice as fast as somebody who has no PhD. Okay, when you say the medical background is not so important, um, on what kind of medical indications or what kind of studies do they work, the CIAs? So first of all, you can differentiate between um, drugs and medical devices, which gives you already a big priority when it comes up to trials. Um, on the other hand, the indication can vary a lot. So if you just take out the drugs, there are a lot of fields you can work in. So Alzheimer's disease, heart, so, um, cardiovascular disease, hematology, cancer. So there's a lot of things on the market where currently um, clinical research is, um, is happening basically. And the field that you are as a CRA may work in, so the indication that you work in depends on the CRO where you are working. Um, because some CROs may be spe uh, specific just work for cancer trials, for example, but the most CROs have a, let's call, potpourri of different trials. So you can, exp you can go through a lot of indications, which is quite interesting because it's always challenging. You always learn something new and um, you gain a lot of experience in the big field of, of um, medications, um, indications, treatments. Um, compared to maybe just sticking to one field that you're working by just doing, for example, cancer um, research for the ne for ten years, for example. So um, there's not like a specific indication you will always work on. Usually, you will have the opportunity to work with a lot of different topics and indications um, during your life as a CRA. Yeah, I can imagine that this kind of flexibility also gives you the chance to really work on these hot topics like uh, you get a study uh, about COVID-19 vaccination and that you have the chance as a CIA to work on such important study. Yeah, exactly. So as a CRA, you actually have the opportunity to work on um, such an important topic like um, currently the COVID-19 infection and how to treat it, how to prevent it maybe, or how to develop a test for in, um, infected patients, for example. So you always have the chance to be in the most actual um, scientific part when it comes up to um, indications and, um, and um, medical field uh, development.
I think that shows also um, how meaningful the job as a CIA might be yeah, and how meaningful clinical research in general is for the society. Yeah, for sure, because in the end everybody may end up having some kind of medical problem, maybe a classic one like a um, cardiovascular problem, which is quite common when you take a look at uh, humanity, or maybe with now with the COVID infections. So there needs to be um, a way to handle these situations by medication or by, um, by treatment in whatever kind of way, or even preventive. So um, it never gets bored. Okay, you said already the control of medical data is very important, but I think uh, also the regulatory part is important. So the compliance checks um, in terms of regulatory paperwork at the study side, I mean, that's usually not the biggest priority of investigators. And therefore, it's important that the CIA has also interest for regulatory documentation, correct? So, yeah, exactly. What you mentioned is basically also another big part of the job as a CRA. So, first of all, before you perform any trial, there needs to be an approval. And when I talk about approval, there's on one hand the approval by the ethic committees when it comes up to patient safety, because this is basically what they mostly cover, but also from regulatory affairs, which are checking if the trial itself can be performed um, according to um, risk benefit analysis. So, these are like the two big points. That you check in the uh, that are going to be checked in the beginning and then approved and then you start to make the trial. But even during the trial, everything needs to be kept in this approval status. So there are regular controls, especially with uh, risk and benefit analysis, to check if the study will still um, continue after a certain amount of maybe events happened during the trial and if it's still um, worth the risk to perform the trial. And all these things need to be um, also checked um, during the trial. And as a CRA, you basically need to check on site if everything is according to um, the regulatory requirements and also the approval. So um, do the site perform according to what has been approved for sure. And especially are the people working on the trial are the ones that are allowed to work on the trial. So this is something that only you as a CRA can check. And it's a lot of paperwork, so it's not like the most favorite topic um, for, the, um, for the investigators, for example. So you always have to keep them busy with um, requesting these things. And um, the investigators also need to have a certain education to perform in the trial. So for example, not only the medical background they have during the years, but especially for clinical trials, they should have ICH GCP training. And these also need to be checked because in Germany, for example, it's a requirement to have these trainings for performing clinical trials. Okay, could you give us one or two examples for regulatory non-compliance, which you can see at, uh, typically see at study sites? Yeah, sure. So, um, just to give you some examples, for example, a classical one is always or maybe the thing that most people are also most afraid of if they hear about clinical trials is that the study site starts with procedures according to the protocol, but the patient has not signed the informed consent, which is a major deviation because um, the whole trial based on the free will of the patient. And if he did not agree in a written way, he, the, the site is actually not allowed to do any kind of um, treatments or um, even any kind of um, investigations with that patient. Um, another um, classical mistake I observe sometimes is that uh, the patient insurance, for example, so there should be a patient insurance always for every um, person that are participating in the trial, but the most current version is not available for the site and also maybe not available for the patients. And um, what was um, happening in basically every, tri uh, every trial during 2018 was um, that according to the new data protection law, for example, patients need to re-sign a lot of things and everything that the patient receives needs also be, to be approved by the ethic committee. So all we call it patient-facing documents um, need to be approved first and then always the most um, 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 uh, latest version is the one that needs to be signed by the patient because it always includes the most um, latest information about the trial. So this is quite important and you as a CRA you first check if the site has all these documents, if they have all been approved 
and if the patient receives it. So these are like the three steps that you cover um, according to um, the point of um, regulatory and um, approvals. Yeah, you, you just mentioned data protection. I think that it's anyway a very critical topic and within clinical research because you're, you're working with so many critical medical uh, data of, of people. Yeah, exactly. So we call it uh, source documents. So it's basically the documents where um, the information is captured the first time that um, according to um, an investigation of a patient. So first time when you, for example, um, when the um, investigator writes down the weight of a patient by hand, this is a source document to give you a simple um, example. And um, during the trials, we may see that there are certain events, which is basically what regular people would call um, side effects of the medication or the um, device and um, in this case when you see an event you also have to report them if they are severe and these reportings usually also requires um, a blinded um, um, copy of the source documents that need to go to a certain department which can check and which are collecting these informations and um, especially these source documents should not contain anything related to the patient so there should be no names no birth dates no identification numbers and um, in respect to the data protection this is quite important because these um, these information should never leave the study site so um, this is also something that the CRA um, checks on a regular basis, for example. When you say patient number, you actually mean the identifier of the patients, because the patient number is just a number of the study, correct? Yes, so when I talk about patient numbers, I mean the identifier of the patient, for example, an insurance number or maybe like an um, identification number that the clinic is using to um, capture the patient as a yeah, profile in their um, files. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, let's continue with the day of the CIA. Uh, so the CIA was at the site, yeah, and it's returning now from the site home or to the office. What happened then? So the first uh, thing that the CRA should do is write the report. When I um, became a CRA, from everybody that I was trained, they told me like, do it as shortly after the visit as possible because everything you saw, everything you captured is still in your brain. So um, you have like a report template with typical questions that you need to check also during the visits and then based on these questions you write your report to make um, a picture of the study site. So you want to capture how the site is performing, what are maybe the problems they're facing um, in general or if it's like site specific problems they have and this should be done quite close after the visit and um, also to um, inform the sites about everything that they need to do you also um, in parallel write the follow-up letter which means like um, an official letter to the site today you usually send it via email um, in previous time it was really a letter <laughs> and um, you send it to the site so you capture um, the most um, everything you did during the visit but especially also what has been the problems that they are facing that they are also aware again of what maybe was, was wrong and on the other hand also what they still need to do because you usually um, want um, to leave the site without any open action items um, or issues but it's not always possible so to give them um, something into the hand that they can work on this follow-up letters basically works also as a kind of a to-do list for them to work on open topics um, that were that occurred during the visit. Okay and to whom does the CIA report? So um, when you take the whole report as a process, first um, person reading the report is um, usually a PM, so a project manager who's reviewing the report. So they are quite familiar with the trial and they're checking if everything that you have checked during the visit uh, is also according to the project. But basically the report itself is on one hand um, the tool for the sponsor to know how the site is performing and on the other hand later or maybe also during the trial in case of inspections or audits also inspector and audits can read these reports so um, there are also people reading the reports who are not familiar with the trial so the PM usually is because he's the manager of the trial but especially auditors and inspectors are like 
third persons which are just getting a glimpse of the trial and um, based on this the report should be also written. So these three um, yeah, groups basically read the report. Okay, but um, actually the report is a tool to keep oversight for the sponsor. Exactly. That means also that the report needs to be very objective. For sure. Yeah. So there should be no judgment or anything. It needs to be written in a neutral way where you list the things you see without judging or evaluation. You just basically write down what you have experienced and then the sponsor um, is the person who decides how he handles the situation. Yeah, but if a, re a report um, contain really bad information. So let's imagine an uh, investigator did not do a good job. Yeah, and worked really badly, then a CIA re needs to report this bad behavior to the sponsor without getting blamed for the bad information. Yeah, so exactly. Um, it should be um, no blaming in the report. That's quite important. You just give your neut uh, uh, neutral impression how the site is performing as a tool to inform the sponsor what has to be, um, what happened and what's the next step that they need to decide on what to do. And um, I'm sure it's also captured in the report, but on the other hand, you can also escalate that immediately to the sponsor in really urgent cases that mm. they can decide how to proceed. Yeah, but what I actually meant is that the CIA, for example, writes in the report, um, the investigator is not doing a good job, yeah, maybe um, he works quite careless, um, then the sponsor cannot blame the CIA for this bad news. No, because no. Um, as a CRA you're basically there first to report things. The important thing when you say about blaming is how is the development of the site. If yeah. I go to the site the first time and see they perform bad, that's just something I can report. But then my duty as a CIA would be to see how I can help the site to improve. And if the improvement is not there, then for sure there may come questions to me why there is no improvement. Then you always need to uh, find um, a solution. Maybe they, you as a CRA are not able to work good with the sites for certain reason. This does not have to do with some professional reasons, but maybe they just simply don't like you yeah. and not willing to work with you, for example. So um, there needs to be a practical way to handle the situation. Okay, that means that CRAs should also have a pragmatic approach. They really need to like solving problems. Definitely, because this is basically what you do most of the time. And um, I would say in regards to solving the problem, the pragmatical uh, solution is the most important thing because you get into um, a medical world which with a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, so you always have to take in consideration how you handle the situation and how you um, do it. Um, in, with the side itself, what, what's working for one side is not working for another side. So there's never a copy and paste situation. Okay, a typical day of a CIA would mean that a CIA first travels to a study site, starts um, the control of medical data, but also reviews the uh, regulatory compliance then returns, writes the reports to the sponsor and tries to, to solve problems, correct? Is that the normal day? So what you mentioned right now basically makes about more than 50% of the time from the CRA. So we talked already about traveling and about 60% of travel time um, um, of the CRA. The other part is a little bit different. So you also have office days, which basically mean you, um, which not only involves writing the report in the office, but also having constant contact with the sites via phone to solve problems, to help them uh, maybe to get information. So um, for the sites or for the sponsors. So a typical situation would be um, the study coordinator is calling because she's new on the trial and she is quite unsecure now performing the first time a visit with a patient and then she's asking you a lot of questions and you need to be there for them. So it's um, for sure the, side, the time you spend on site for checking data and then in the end uh, writing the report. But on the other hand, you're also the number one contact for the sites 
to ask questions and to support you. And this is basically the second part that you are doing and you do it also remotely, as I said, via phone, via email. So uh, you support um, a lot of um, yeah, different areas as well, especially the site. I can imagine that you, they also need a lot of training. I mean, when they are working on different indications, somebody needs to train them. And, and then regulations are changing from time to time, so somebody needs to train them. And then quality standards change from time to time. Again, somebody needs to train them. That means also a lot of work for them getting trained, correct? Exactly. So um, on one hand, there's the training on study specific topics because also the protocol can change various during the trial itself, but also, as you mentioned, maybe changes according to, um, to the law or regulations um, that need to be um, trained to decide that they are aware what's um, now the change and what are they allowed to do or what they're not allowed to do anymore. And this is usually also done um, on one hand by the CRA, in case they also not do any professional trainings on that, depending on the situation. Yeah, and also the electronic tools. Exactly, so yeah. they work a lot of with electronic tools, so data capturing is usually, I would say 95% minimum just electronically, so they need to know how to handle the systems. Or if you have a trial that, that we call um, blinded, that means neither the patient nor the investigator are allowed to know if a patient receives um, the actual medication or a placebo. Then you have also an electronic system that um, gives um, out the numbers of the IMP. So we call, or we call it IMP, the medicine that the patient receives. And just the system knows, is the patient now on the um, study drug or is he um, on the placebo? and all these systems coming together and uh, there needs to be a lot of training for sites to um, be able to handle these systems um, on a regular basis and uh, the way it should be handled that there are no mistakes. So um, this is usually also done and supported by the CRA. Yeah, very nice. I think um, getting training and the willingness to be educated for your whole life is nowadays very important but especially for CIS. Yeah, so since you are the, the major contact point for the site, you will be always the one they call, uh, the, the site is calling. So in case they have a question, they call you. In case they have a problem, they will call you. And um, then you need um, to know it or you at least know how to, uh, where to look it up or where you get the information that you can support them in a very short time frame. Because they call you when it's urgent. Okay, great. So it, it seems that the CIA really um, needs to do a lot and also needs to learn a lot. Let's summarize it. When you would describe a perfect CIA, what, what, what would be your description? So um, based on everything we already talked about, I would say the perfect CIA for sure should be um, professional and familiar with everything regarding the trial he's working on. So the documents, the protocol, the procedures. But on the other hand, um, a very, very important um, part of the job is to have communication skills. Because you're in a situation, imagine that you go on site and you talk to a, a doctor and you tell a, an investigator, a doctor, what he may does not correct or what he needs to do. And um, you need to do it in a way that they still like to work with you. So you should be uh, somehow between um, a professional appearance with uh, telling them what to do, but on a very empathic way. So you need to figure out which is the right situation when you can talk with them. And um, to be able to do that, you need to have also certain organization skills. So it's not like they're going to stick to your schedule when you go on site. You also need to be flexible enough to adapt to the situation on site, and, but nevertheless go out and be satisfied with telling them what you want and what you need to tell them to do everything correctly. And um, for me, this kind of sums up all together in the word, word teamwork, which is a word that a lot of people are currently using, but you need to be a team worker. On one hand, for sure, with the team you're working with the other CRAs, with your project manager, that's for sure, but also with the site. Because when you get to the point that the site also sees you as part of their team because you can support them, they will always like to work with you. And um, if you're able to do that, then um, 
no matter what kind of problems they may face, they will always contact you and they will be always willing to support you in case you need something. So it's like a good um, relationship that you need to build over the time and this, as I said, based on your professional knowledge but also on the communication that you should have. Okay, yeah, interesting. When you speak about communication, that this is one of the most important um, skills a CIA needs to have. Um, What's the language? So what kind of languages does a CIA need to speak? So every CIA for sure needs to speak English because all documents are in English. The protocol will be in English, um, all manuals will be in English, the data capture system will be in English. But um, the second part, they need to be able to talk and to understand is the language of the country they work in. So for example, in Germany, they should be able to talk, to communicate in German, but also to read scientific files in German. So it's not sufficient enough to say hello and goodbye and have like a nice chat with the site. You also need to be able to read patient files in German with abbreviations from doctors. And this is quite tricky sometimes. And if you're not really familiar with the language, then you just simply can't do one of the most important things you're there for, which is called so start a review, where you basically check if the data that are written in the source documents are really captured in the um, electronic system. And this can only be done if you are really familiar with the language. So I could not, for example, go to Italy because I don't speak Italian, it would not make sense to send me there, but it would be okay to send me to Great Britain or um, somewhere in Austria because this is a language I can handle. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think also the legal language, so the wording uh, is differently. So when you get an, an ethics approval, for example, they use a certain wording um, which Germans understand. Yeah. But people from abroad have problems with that. Exactly. And yeah. especially if you check if a person is approved for a trial. So for Austria, for example, every sub-investigator needs to be approved, uh, approved by the Ethics Committee. For, you need to read the approvals. Um, you need to capture, is this person allowed to work on the trial or not? And if you're not familiar with the language, you basically can't do that. Okay, I think it's not so easy to be a perfect CIA. Um, let's ask vice versa, um, who should not become a CIA? So I would say people who don't like to communicate should not become a CRA because as I said before, it's one of the essential tools you need to have. And on the other hand, also if you don't like to learn new things, no matter if it comes up to electronic systems or to indication background or whatever, because it's a quite challenging job. It's a um, medical area is always developing. Research basically means finding a way how to deal with new problems. And in case you just don't want to deal with these things, then CRA is not a, really a job for you. And if you like to do things um, or you like to work on your own, independently from a lot of um, other people or other um, yeah, groups, then I would say CRA is also not the best job for you. Yeah, I think the, the serving attitude is also important. So if people are just saying, I need to be, I need to feel good and for me it needs to be important, um, then it's not the right way. So they really need to think I like to help the investigators, I like to help the study nurses, I like to help the sponsor instead of me, 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 correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you also need to be a little bit proactive in that way. You need to figure out what could be helpful for them. And you may need to think outside the box to find a solution for a site that's quite tricky. And um, I think this is like, um, like the key um, point that should be there and you need to be you need to have fun with doing these things, otherwise um, it's not the job for you. Fun is anyway very important, thank you. Okay Bianca, let's come to my last question. Imagine people are watching our video and, and they think about that may be a position for me um, and you would need to write some recommendations or let's say a checklist where they really can evaluate if they are made to become a CIA. Um, how would a checklist look like? 
So um, besides from the fact with that checklist, I would first mention that you may get um, a bigger overview what the job actually and what the tasks you will perform um, are to get more detailed idea what the CRA job means beside that video here. And then um, when it comes up to the checklist, I would take that into consideration. So um, based on your background, maybe. So what do I bring to perform the job? what kind of background, what kind of knowledge I have would be like one point. And then just the classic things like, do you like to travel? Not only like from time to time, but do you like to do it in a more frequent way? Or do you like to be away for maybe a week because it's possible to visit several sites in one city and you are away for like a week? Um, this is a quite important and crucial point for the job. Do you like to communicate a lot? Um, is it, uh, do you have fun with talking with people during the whole day or do you more prefer to have three phone calls and then that's it for the day? So um, things like that. And um, are, you, are you patient enough to, ex uh, are you a good um, explainer, to a trainer, teacher for sites, maybe also for colleagues? And are you well organized? So how good um, are you able to structure your day, your work, your tasks that you have to do? And um, are you flexible enough, for example, to adjust to changes that you have not planned for your day? Um, so these are like quite crucial points for me, how you can figure out if this is a job that um, you are made for. Yeah. Would you consider that job as stressful? I think stressful is always a point of view for me because um, for sure traveling can become stressful in case there's a delay or anything but it's the fact how you handle the situation and what you make with that time that you have so you can take it as a stressful situation because you may be one hour late on site on the other hand you can take that hour to prepare a little bit better and work faster there so um, I would not consider it as stressful per se, it's just the way how you handle it and this is why I say you need to figure out how good are you able to um, perform those tasks that's on your checklist and if you are good with that you probably won't end up in um, stressful days every time. Bianca, thank you very much for the nice explanation. I think you are completely right. When you are doing things you like, you are getting not so easily stressed by the things you make. Uh, whereas if you do things for which you are not made, it's anyway stressful. Um, and that's important to understand. I think uh, you explained the CIA job very nicely and I think it's a very important job. Uh, you are a meaningful part of the development of drugs and medical devices. And the job is so important. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, make that video with you and to give a little bit an insight about the job that I was doing the last six years. And um, I hope it helps people to get an idea how it's really working and if they're interested in doing a CRA job in their future. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure um, you will get some applications very soon. Uh, I hope you liked the video. If you have questions, send them to us and leave your comments. Subscribe our channel and see you the next time. Bye bye.